We welcome back the author of Global Warming, Understanding the Forecast, Andrew Revkin. He's also a blogger at the New York Times Dot Earth blog. This week, we've looked at creating an eco-friendly city, the sometimes unexpected pitfalls of energy efficiency initiatives, and America's growing reliance on our own oil sands. Tonight, we look at what some geologists are calling a new era, the Anthropocene, the age of man. What is it, and why do experts think that framing the climate change debate with this label will give us the wake-up call we need? Well, Andrew Rebkin's back to talk about all these things. Uh, hi, Andrew. Hey, it's good to be with you again. Okay, so we are going to be talking about the Anthropocene. Now, geologists have always used, uh, well, big words in my opinion, uh, but various ones to, de to, to delineate different periods of Earth on time. What is the Anthropocene and what defines it? Well, the, the geologists have names for all these different layers of time going back. Uh, Paleozoic, the Cretaceous, uh, the last 12, 11,000 years or so since the end of the last ice age was given the name Holocene. We've been living in the Holocene. Humanity basically came of age as a species, uh, spread around the world and became what it is today through this period called the Holocene. It's a geological epoch. And now, uh, the last 10 years or so, there's been a growing proposal that uh, we're now in an era because of our fundamental ability to actually influence planet scale systems that are the rise in greenhouse gases from human activities will have a, a geological imprint for a, as long as we're uh, around and active uh, and other aspects of what we do have changed the sort of biogeochemistry of the planet that we're now in an era of our own making and this is a new thing uh, and so the, there's a formal proposal working its way through the geological community that we are in the Anthropocene. Now it comes with all kinds of, that, that geological question is a pretty technical one. But the, this, the term has had a lot of appeal in the, sen, in the broader sense that we're now in an era of our own making and our own choosing. So going forward, Earth is kind of increasingly becoming what we choose to make of it. And, and, and choosing not to choose is a choice as well. So business as usual is part of that. And it's a very uncomfortable feeling. This has been a core theme of Dot Earth of my blog and of my writing going way back. Even my, my global warming book in 1992, I had laid out essentially this idea that we were entering a geological period of our own making. And, and that's an uncomfortable thing for a species. As far as we know, we're the first one. There have been other species in the past that did change the fundamental nature of the planet. A cyanobacteria, these, these sort of blue-green algae critters, uh, a couple billion years ago, added oxygen to the air in, 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 the, modern, in the, the way that we now, as a species and many others, rely on. They weren't, but cyanobacteria weren't aware of the fact that they had become a planet-scale player, and we are. And so that gives us this very uncomfortable situation. Well, why does it make us uncomfortable? Well, I think it's, uh, to me, and I've alluded to this on, in my writing off and on, that it's kind of like we're almost at that juncture that an individual human goes through from adolescence to adulthood. Adolescence is that pure muscle flexing, wow, look what I can do, period. And, and essentially the last couple of hundred years of human history have been kind of like that. We've celebrated our industrialization and our potency. Uh, you look at back at National Geographic magazines from the 1950s, and, and I have a number of them, and they're wonderful. They give you this sense, wow, look what we can do. And, and now uh, the, the indicators from science are that we're approaching limits, that we're sort of like... Uh, bacteria that's been put on a petri dish and we're now we see there's an edge to that dish and that that's the thing the juncture between adolescence and adulthood is like the difference between being in a sprint and being a, a marathoner where you really settle in for the long haul and that's never very easy i don't know about you but my my transition to adulthood <laughs> like many was, was sort of slow and halting and almost uh, almost uh, something you didn't really want to have to go through let me ask you this. So this is about more than just uh, coming up with a new term. It has, as you said, geologists uh, will have to debate this and get to the technicalities of it. But is this term useful in the sense that it, it serves as a, a wake-up call to all of us? Well, maybe. You know, I, I don't think if you went out on the street right now and said, ask people to define <laughs> Anthropocene, I mean, it's hard enough to get some common understanding of a term like global warming. So I, I don't think we're remotely near this becoming some dominant meme of our, our time. But I do think that overall the sense of starting to normalize, even in the way kids learn about Earth history, that we're now in an era that has our fingerprints all over it, is, is helpful. 
and um, just making sure people understand that a system that seems so grand and limitless, a system like the oceans or, or like um, the climate, the atmosphere, is actually substantially transformed. That the, o the oceans, we don't really realize this day to day, but the, uh, the great fishes of the oceans are 80 or 90 percent depleted from where they were just a half century ago. 80 or 90 percent reduction in the, hmm. the number, the mass of tunas and, and the other great fishes. The Amazon River, supposedly two or three hundred years ago, the turtles were so numerous that you couldn't see the water sometimes across the great expanse of that river. It would be just sort of turtle shells. Uh, I grew up in New England, and uh, this old codger I used to work with at a marine fisheries place, uh, division talked about when he was young how we use lobsters as cod bait. <laughs> and, and that's all, you know, we lose track of just how powerfully we've transformed this place that we live in. Uh, you mentioned that in the years before this term kind of came into common parlance, uh, not that it's very well used, that you would have been talking about this, this idea. Is, is this how uh, the role you played in coming up with this concept? I'm a, I am a footnote in history now, officially. <laughs> there, there's a, there was a technical paper about the history of the idea of the Anthropocene, and there's a very generous section there about my 1992 book, Global Warming uh, book, which had this line. And I, I stumbled, and I didn't know Greek back in 1992, and uh, I, I proposed calling you it now? the Anthropocene. Uh, no, no, I don't now. <laughs> well, now I know my roots better, but, but I proposed calling it the Anthropocene, this era of uh, geological, you know, where there's a geological imprint from humanity. And, and uh, if I had just added the P.O., which is uh, anthropology, anthro, anthropocentric, um, then I would be a, a, a more of a mainstream part of uh, this conversation going forward. <laughs> but it's been fun even to be a footnote. Very good. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about uh, a gentleman you're probably familiar with, Will Steffen from the Australian National University's Climate Change Institute. He is one of uh, the main proponents of uh, the Anthropocene. And I want to read some of what he had to say in a report that was published uh, back in May. Here's what he wrote. Our planet's ability to provide an accommodating environment for humanity is being challenged by our own activities. The environment, our life support system, is changing rapidly from the stable Holocene state of the last 12,000 years during which we developed agriculture, villages, cities and contemporary civilizations to an unknown future state of significantly different conditions. One way to address this challenge is to determine safe boundaries based on fundamental characteristics of our planet and to operate within them. By boundary, we mean a specific point related to a global scale environmental process beyond which humanity should not go. Andrew Revkin, what are some of the areas where we should create these kinds of boundaries? Um, I, I Personally, I see that work as a, implying a level of knowledge that's uh, higher than I think it exists in the sense that, to me, a better way of framing our um, going forward is trajectories toward risk. If you can shift them away from risk, then you have a better, I think that's a little bit of a better way to look at this. Boundaries, uh, I wrote a lot about this in a climate context because there's been this, um, there was a two, to th two degree th centigrade threshold above pre-industrial temperature that was established as a political uh, kind of don't go area. But there, there are problems when you set boundaries like that and as with that one we're almost assuredly going to go through it. And then do you just say okay oh well now we're just doomed or do you uh, keep working to constrain greenhouse gases that kind of thing. Um, and the, the level of uncertainty about the, these boundaries is high. So it, it's, to me it's more about trajectories. Um, I did a piece on Dot Earth not long ago called Pedal to the Metal, which is, uh, I think that's a Canadian expression too, when you really <laughs> floor a car, you know, and you put that, that accelerator down. And uh, when I was in high school, a friend of mine took me in his uh, real souped up car up to about 125 miles an hour for, until the, <laughs> he burned a quarter of a tank of gas <laughs> in a very short period of time. And so I know you have that feeling, oh my God. And, and to me, right now, the thing is to, really work hard to get the pedal back off the metal. And the, the idea that there's a safe boundary that can be delineated clearly, I think, uh, can be um, a little distracting from the reality that it's trajectories that sort of that need to be shifted. Uh, and, and also an embracing of the uncertainty rather than trying to downplay it. And I'm not criticizing the overall body of work. I just think that uh, a better framing for the challenge is, is sort of what I just proposed there. Give me an example of where shifting the trajectory uh, would be more beneficial. Give me a concrete example. 
Well, I guess uh, you look at fisheries. Uh, the bluefin tuna is being, it's not going to go extinct. Uh, it's, uh, the chances of the, this ocean roaming fish going extinct utterly are pretty low. And, and it's, it's not zero, but it's very hard to understand extinction to that extent. But it's become clear that it's, it's marginally, it's, it's getting to the point of marginal utility as a resource, yet the sense of getting that last big bluefin for the sushi trade is, is relentless. And so finding ways to shift uh, habits and attitudes that can really give that fish a better chance going forward, I think, um, are, are, are important. But they, they don't relate to some clear understanding of, you know, it's the 250,000th fish that will render it extinct. <laughs> I guess that's, that's one way to look at it. And the same thing with greenhouse gases and warming. Um, again, given the durable uncertainties, as I said at the beginning of our week-long conversation, uh, idea, the idea that there's some easily defined threshold uh, that is a, is a tipping point really doesn't hold up very well. When you look at all of these putative tipping points in total, what you see is rising emissions equals rising risk. And that, to me, is a very general and pretty profound uh, prescription menu for saying we need to start modulating those trajectories. You know, one of the uh, things you write quite often about is this idea that when we're discussing environmental or physical sciences, that we need to expand, to, to have a broader approach, to let it uh, go into areas and in different disciplines such, such as sociology and the arts. And I'm curious, Andrew, how would a scientific classification manifest itself in something like the arts? Well, what I see is useful. Um, one image that I use on the blog when I s discuss um, new prospects for integrating and understanding these issues better is, is a, a British science illustrator named Adam Neiman uh, came up with a different way of sort of giving us a quantitative understanding of the atmosphere and the oceans. He, he said, okay, if you peel away the world's oceans, all the liquid water on the planet, put it in the form of a, a sphere, put it in the, the form of a sphere, what, how big would that be? compared to the sphere of the Earth itself. And it's really small. It kind of covers, it's like this little green marble that covers a uh, part of the Midwest of the United States. Mm. So that says to me, it's a great way to start a conversation about the oceans and, and the world's liquid water assets when, to start with that first. And the atmosphere is similar. It's a small ball compared to the large Earth. And so as we head toward 9 billion people, it's a good starting point. It's a visualization that's novel and gets us out of our um, that mindset that the these are e sort of eternal, uh, infinite resources. And it's not judgmental. It's not a sort of woe is me or shame on you kind of imagery. It's just a way of, it's a new kind of way of using art, literally, visualization, to start a different kind of a conversation. And I think we've just barely tapped the potential for doing that. Andrew Revkin, thank you for this most enjoyable week and insightful conversation. Thanks for this. It's my pleasure.